welcome to another episode of the Straight Up Chicago Investor Podcast. I'm Tom Shellcross, licensed agent with Second City Real Estate. With me, as always, is Mark Ainley, founder and owner of GC Realty. Mark, I'm seeing a lot of you these days. This is great. Yeah, we're, we're having a heavy recording week, so I like that. But that means that we have to figure out things to talk about more often uh, throughout the week. So, <laughs> But uh, what uh, what's going on? I know last episode we talked about, a couple episodes ago on the Million Dollar Five uh, five unit we did in Batavia, we talked about escrow holdback, but I think you had a scenario that you recently had a situation where you almost got in trouble with that. Give us those details. Yeah. Before I go there though, just funny note, like we sit here and say, like, we try to think of things to talk to. Yeah. We went to dinner the other night for about four hours. And it's like, <laughs> why can't we just remember like 10 minutes of any of that and use it as banter? Like we <laughs> sit there and talk forever. <laughs> and I'm like, Hey, do we have banter today? Like, no, what are we going to talk about? <laughs> All right. So, uh, the escrow holdback. So if you remember, we talked about, this is when, you know, both sides want to close before the job is done. So think for example, like, Hey, we want to move in because our lease is up or whatever. We know the project's 99% done. And us as the developer or the seller in this situation, we want to close and get, you know, close out our Renovo loan or whatever, whatever debt we have and, and be done and just be, you know, get that off our backs and have our proceeds, except we hold back some of those proceeds. And that is our obligation to come back. Hey, we're going to hold back 20 grand to ensure you guys come back and actually finish off the last, you know, 5%, 1%, whatever's left to do. So one of the things we had on this, uh, this was one that uh, we did in Logan Square. We had a, uh, we still had an electrical inspection to do. And, you know, we went, we, we did everything that was asked of us. We had the inspection this morning. We didn't know this, but the person who bought the home, they wanted additional outlets. So they hired a, you know, handyman type person who came in and they added wires directly to one of the breakers to gain additional electric, additional electric, just straight from one of the breakers. So we didn't know this. We show up and you know the inspector's like, this is obviously, you can't do this, this is obviously wrong. And so we're sitting there going like, what the hell happened here? Like, this wasn't here the first time, blah, blah, blah. And then we talked to the seller or to the buyer, I should say, who said, oh, you know, sorry, didn't realize it. But I guess it's a... Uh, it's another lesson learned of when we do these escrow holdbacks, like now we have to have our legal language in there to say, you know, hey, you are not going to touch XYZ system. Inspections are, you know, you know, we we will get paid regardless if you do any of these things just to protect us. Do you guys have a process uh, in construction for kind of before pictures, after pictures, just to kind of just for reference or just keep things straight? Real good on pictures. Yeah. Um, Chris is real good about that. Now we now we actually use Slack. So we put them in there. Right. So we have like a, we use that almost as our like just picture repository for each job, like each channel is a different job. Um, and in this example, this was no harm, no foul because we've done everything they asked of us. Like this was the last thing before we got our, our, our funds. And we, we've gotten like a friendly relationship where we've been joking with this guy. So he said, Oh, this is my fault. I had a handyman out here. You guys have done everything else. We know you're on the hook with the city regardless to get this closed out. So I'll release the funds. So everything we didn't get hurt here, but. If this had been contentious leading up to this point, he could kind of hold a hold a gun to our head here. And you know, again, we're we're talking about waiting another three or four weeks, not the end of the world, but it's another three or four weeks, right? Like it's it sucks. Well, you built a rapport with the buyer and you built a rapport with the inspector where he didn't freak out and and start digging into other things as well, too. So I, I think there's two other strong points that you have going for you that other people should know. Yeah, but again, like kind of lucky, right? lesson learned our legal language has to be tighter on these things now but it's another thing that you don't think of until it happens yeah i agree so all right so that was my little adventure today. what do you got for a housing provider tip of the week housing provider tip of the week last week we talked about uh, uh notices and the time frame it starts but process server that's been something that uh i think we use a lot more often these days and i think uh property managers should because it used to be where you could post a five-day notice and Maybe it was never really that, but the courts have gotten stricter on that. You know, 20 years ago, uh, when I first got into this, you could post a notice and go and evict somebody. Now, uh, they're, they're very keen on getting it physically handed to somebody 13 and over that lives in the residence. So, um, you know, to pay a process server 85 or $95 to hunt them down, whether it be at their work or at their house, uh, there's a lot of time spent. And your, your, your time, my tip is along the lines of your time is worth um, your time is worth money. So have, spend that 95, hundred bucks to, uh, get the process server, uh, the document, which then now they are accountable and they have to attest that they served it and, and sign the affidavit and all that stuff. And then you have, uh, you know, if it takes you three or four hours to get something like that done, maybe you got to travel a half hour of the property, uh, each way that's an hour 
Plus, maybe if you, if you don't get it, your time's worth money. So utilize process service. And I also think uh, anyone out there trying to explore a career in, in real estate, there's a shortage of process service right now as well, too. Um, so if you're looking to get your, it's a special license you have to get. So if someone's trying to figure out what they want to do around real estate, that might not be a, a bad venture because you get a couple bigger property managers, bigger landlords that, you know, for us, we use process server for 60 day notices, 120 day notices, just to make sure that uh, they're officially uh, getting these things. So uh, it might be a career in that as well, too. Rough career, man. <laughs> you got to have some guts to do that. Oh, see, I think it'd be fun. <laughs> well, I remember we had this conversation. We I, we were with John Warren and we're like, oh, what did you do last week? And he's like, I sat in a bush for three hours and served my guy. Yes. I was like, dude, hire someone. What were yes. you doing? You have yes. three kids. There's two things, his time and control issues and risk factors. There are three issues for him right there. <laughs> yeah. So, all right, good tip. Let's, let's dive in. Today's episode is going to be a nice one, guys. We're going to be talking, we're going to be breaking down underwriting, which is probably one of the, at a macro level, one of the most, requested items for us to speak of. And today we're actually going to have someone with a, a plethora of experience go through a deal with us and talk about how brokers put together an OM and actually come up with their number, which a lot of times might seem like magic, but there's a whole lot of uh, details and inputs that go into that. So our guest today, experienced broker, uh, someone I've had the pleasure of getting to know well, getting to know well over the last few years. He's currently a director at Essex, uh, who are friends and sponsors of the show. Before spending his last six years in Chicago as a broker specializing on the North Side, he actually spent seven years as a history and math teacher. Uh, RE Journal has uh, recognized him as a CRE future leader. He's an active member of the Rogers Park Builders Group and Edgewater Uptown Builders Association, both uh, both subs uh, subgroups within the NBOA. And Mark, most importantly, another U of I grad to uh, grace the show here. So without further ado, Rick Hoffman, welcome to the show. Rick, how are you doing, man? I'm doing great, Tom. Thanks, uh, thanks to you and Mark for having me on here. Uh, longtime listener, and uh, just excited to to share a few things that I've learned in the last six years about real estate. All right, how far do you guys go back? Do you guys go back to U of I? Like, is there? A- no, I, I we go back. I don't know. Probably probably about three three years. Oh, okay, three years. I think we first started looking at properties together. Yeah. So Rick, Rick knew me. Uh, or Rick was too cool to know me at U of I, probably. Well, I just think that I'm a lot younger than you, Tom. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably also accurate. Could be. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about underwriting and talk about the different components that go into it. I think it's very important to say we're doing this from the broker's perspective here, because if you ask 10 different operators, if you gave them an OM with no pricing on it and just said, hey, here's the inputs, come up with the value of this building, you're going to get 10 different answers. They're probably going to be all within you know a pretty close range. But there is a little bit of art to this. Everyone has a little bit of a different flavor, um, and it's, it could be very specific to the situation. So if you're new to this, don't take this as the gospel. This is set to be a structure to, to help guide you. And if you've been around for a while, you're probably going to pick up just a couple tidbits here or there to help you with your underwriting moving forward. So just full disclosure on the front end here. But Rick, take it away here. Just talk. So, what is underwriting? Like, love what, what goes into it here? So underwriting, essentially, when we say underwriting, and I first came into this and I had no idea what underwriting was, right? But it's it's basically figuring out the value of an investment and determining what kind of return you need and how much you're willing to pay for that. And so when we underwrite, we combine, uh, we just look at the property, what's the income, what are the expenses, and then factor in uh, a few other components on you know, the debt market, you have to figure out your financing, so you can determine how much you're willing to pay for a property. It's not necessarily the value, right? The, the value is whatever somebody else is willing to pay for it. But uh, to, to get to underwriting, as a broker, I, I sit back, I look, and I try to figure out, okay, well, what is the current snapshot of the property, right? What, what is the current owner doing with their income? They're going to operate that building differently, their expenses. I look at, okay, if Tom's buying the building, What's he going to do with the building differently? How is he going to increase income or cut his expenses? And then I try to look at uh, kind of long-term, what is the exit strategy five, seven, 10 years down the line? And I look at those three different scenarios and try to balance what I believe to be the value of the building. Um, I don't want to talk forever straight here. So, you know, I'm going to go back to my teaching days where I'm going to ask students to stop me, ask questions, (laughs) cut me off and keep me on track. So, um, sure. So, so real quick, I, a lot of our investors who are used to seeing OMs and saying, you know, 
it's common between brokers and investors, right? How the hell did you think it's worth this? How much of that, like when, when you have to make assumptions, talk about just that process, right? Of whether you're making a vacancy assumption, whether it's, you know, how much rehab needs to go into it to actually raise the rents to the, to the performer rent. Just talk about that, that process of working and coming up with these, with these assumptions while still, again, you're working for the seller, right? Your job is to get them the best price. Precisely. And as a broker, we're going to underwrite differently than a lender who's going to be much more conservative and operators who underwrite and try to determine, you know, how is it realistically going to go? What we do is we're going to try to paint this building in the best light possible without crossing that line of, you know, being the worst thing in the world for a broker is to, to, to have operators or clients look at an OM and say, God, this guy's totally full of it. Like there's no way that these rents are possible. And so I try to make sure that every assumption I make is defensible or defendable. And at the same time, I'm optimistic. I have to, I owe it to the seller to say, you know, if this is done right, I think the market will bear these rents. Or I think that you can cut your maintenance expense by this much, even though they're currently operating it in one way, doesn't necessarily mean that the, the next guy who owns the building is going to operate it that same way. Got it. Okay. So let's walk through here. You mentioned, you, you know, we have income, we have expense, we have the debt, we have the physical plant. Talk to us a little about the physical state before we, we dive into yeah. actual rental income here, because I think it's, it's one of the things that's missed by a lot of investors or, or, uh, uh, under, uh, underappreciated. So what I'll say is when I'm looking at a property and the first thing I do is I try to figure out what is essentially the play at the building? Is it a gut renovation? Is the building in need of capital improvements right away where you're going to be spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to uh, repair some of the components? And we say physical plant, like, is the roof you know, in good shape? Do you need just another coat on it or do you need to tear it off completely because it's going to cost a very different amount? You know, what's the state of the boiler? What are the, you know, do you need to replace the windows? Do you need to replace lintels? porches, et cetera. And so you have to factor in any of this, right? Is, is it a stabilized asset where all of this has been done? Has it been gut renovated in the last couple of years? Is it new construction? And so when we talk about the physical plant, that's what we're looking at. And it helps us determine kind of which lens is going to be most useful when underwriting. So if I know that it is a gut renovation, as in this whole building needs you know, $100,000 per unit to make it what I expect it to be, then I'm probably going to be looking at a long-term goal. I'm going to be looking at uh, an IRR analysis, which I'm not going to get into today. But if on the flip side, you know, it's a six flat that has been renovated in the last 10 years, it's in good shape, the rents are close to top of the market or right where they should be, and it doesn't have major capital expenses coming up, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the current picture, and then I'm going to look at the year one picture. And I'm going to find a blend for that and determine kind of where the value is. Got it. All right. So let's talk about income. So income and Tom, bear with me. My computer just died. So this is good. Uh, I get to, instead of going through an outline, I can just talk. Um, <laughs> income, income basically for an investment that we're looking at in multifamily real estate, your income is derived pretty much from your rental income, right? That's the revenue you're getting. Uh, you guys probably know that, I mean, in your buildings, you get your rent every month. What else? What other income do you get? Mark, what are what are other besides the rental income? What else we got here? You get uh, you know, maybe lease renewal fees or coin operate or coin machines. Um laundry, right? Yeah, laundry. Um pet fees, okay. parking. Yeah, parking. Pet fees are good. Move in, move out fees. I've seen fees for a lot of different things. I think uh, a lot of operators right now are using rubs or you know, kind of a utility bill back, uh, some way to recapture some of their utility costs, especially if they're providing heat through a boiler. Uh, people are starting to charge for water and sewer. I've even had a few clients tell me that they have a specific fee for tax increases that Cook County is laying on them, but that's a discussion for time. Um, and so the Basically, your income is simple. That you look at the income that you're currently getting, and uh, maybe as a broker, mm -hmm. I'll look at at the building and try to figure out 
Because my, my pro forma or my year one is, is to see, okay, what is the market doing for this building? Are they maximizing their income realistically? Sure, there might be one unit in the building that's, let's say it's a, a six flat with all two bedroom, one bath units, you know, and five of the units are rented for 1500, but one unit is rented for 1850, right? I want to look at that one unit and understand. I think when I first started, I would say, oh, wow, 1850, that's market. I'm going to move all the rents to 1850 right away. And that'll be my pro forma. And I got a lot of pushback from the market saying like, why, right? So I try to figure out where the market rents are. You look at comps and then I'll set my market rents realistically towards the higher end of where I think an operator can achieve in the current state without doing any work to those units. That's what my year, year one works. If I think it's a value add project and I think somebody's gonna have to spend money to improve on the bathrooms or improve the kitchen, or add an amenity, right? Add in unit laundry right now, you'll be able to kick up your rent. It costs money to get there. And so then in my OM, what you'll see is I'll have a, maybe a year one with renovation, like post renovation, and that'll incorporate, you know, whatever I'm thinking the capital improvement cost will be at the beginning to the purchase price to get the same, I guess, value metrics that I'm going to talk about later. Yeah. So, so two comments there. So one, I, I I do think S6 does a nice job of at least outlining. A lot of times you just see the pro forma, but you don't see the, hey, it's going to take you 200 grand to get there. Mm-hmm. Right. So whether the construction number is wrong, there's at least an effort to come there and say, you know, we estimate it's going to be this to get you to this, right. Just to help kind of guide the, guide the investor there. I, one other note for investors out there, you know, I, I think one thing that people struggle with is, in that example, like, hey, we can raise rents to eighteen hundred without doing any work. Keep in mind, you are doing work, right? You were you were having very tough conversations. You are going to get some pushback. Like you are you're not just pushing a button and making that happen. So to just think like, oh, there, you know, there's no effort here because there's no rehab. There's still a lot of effort, and, and you know, you can't just pay top dollar. For that, you're the one putting in that effort. Maybe not as tough as an effort as rehab, but you are putting an effort to make that happen. Right. Mark, you're going to comment there. Well, I was to say um, we were trying to figure out uh, a metric around what the breaking point is for people to move versus actually pay a huge increase as well, too. So that's something to always look at. So that eighteen hundred dollar market rent, if they're paying fourteen hundred. Yeah, there's you might get chance, fifteen fifty or whatever. You're not. There's just a good chance say, Here's you're either. Yeah, you're going to fall short of that or. If you try pushing it, they're going to move and then you're going to have a, a few thousand dollar turnover and then uh, a cost associated. You might get up to that, but it's still going to cost you, whether it be lost rent or, or improvements, uh, four or five grand to get to that point. It still can be great deals. Factor this all in though, right? Yes. Like that's that's the point. That's a great point that, that both you made. There's no magic button that just says, oh, just because you're getting this rent in one unit or the market rent is you know 1800, it doesn't mean that you're going to be able to jump to that with all your units. You may have to negotiate, accept fifteen hundred, accept sixteen hundred, and and take what you can because you want to avoid that move out. I just actually sold a building, uh, I think it closed in July, and I knew that the market rents were about ten percent below market, and I, you know, put that in my OM, explained it, and the guy that bought it said he agreed. And before we even closed, we were able to to change. It was a twelve unit building. We got four of those units were bumped up to the market rent that I put in my OM, without a problem. Tenants were like, "We'll do it." After it closed, that same operator said he couldn't get those rents. The, the tenants didn't bump up and he actually went down in some of his rents. So like, I felt terrible thinking, shoot, like I had these market rents in there and I believed them and he's not able to get them. So it's not just like this guarantee that you're going to get there. It does take. So. One, one other tidbit to add here. If you have undervalued rents like this, when you are under contract, you need to make it crystal clear that the current seller, if you're the buyer of the situation, cannot renew any leases. Because he, you know, he might be friendly with them and put them on a five-year lease at that lower market rent, and then you're handcuffed, right? That's got to be in your attorney review just to protect yourself. Yeah, most exactly. part, even on a single unit, that should be in there as well, too. Yeah, they can't absolutely. Without your permission, most attorneys will keep that in. I know, in when I'm writing up offers, I put that in. Um, and additionally, if there is a, I'm pretty sure if you do a, an offer that's, or if you see a, a sweetheart lease that's four years and at a below market rate, you can usually get that wiped out. But it has yep. to be a. Um, all right. So we're going to talk real numbers here, but before doing that, we've talked on the income side. Let's talk expenses. Okay. So expenses, the, 
we all know taxes are, are one of the greatest expenses you're going to have for any multifamily property. And it is terribly important for you to know what's happening in, uh, in Cook County, assuming that you're buying something in Chicago. Uh, we just had our triennial and uh, the assessments came back much, much higher than we thought they were going to be or hoped that they were going to be. And the tax bills came out in the last couple of weeks. So you should know where your taxes are. As a buyer, you need to figure out where you believe taxes are going to be. I encourage you to talk to a tax professional. As a broker, I'm constantly talking to different tax professionals to try to figure out where I can make my best guess on where taxes are going to be the following year, especially if it's one of the years where they're going to change up the assessments drastically, which was this past year. We were always using 15 to 17%, but I mean, you'll see taxes for buildings anywhere between 10 and, and I've seen some taxes that are even 20%. And when I say percent, I'm saying a percent of your gross income on the building. So if your gross rents for the entire year are $100,000, it's safe to assume taxes, you know, 15 to 18K, somewhere in that range is a good baseline. Right. And it, you know, it, it does, uh, especially if it's more than a, a five unit building. Yep. And then obviously guys, if you're increasing your rents, don't, you can't not increase that side of the equation as well. And that's something that we, we didn't even talk about, but when you're, when you're looking at a long-term model, when you're trying to value buildings, you have to look at income growth and expense growth, and you have to have a percentage there and have to figure out, you know, do you think expense growth is going to be greater than income growth or rent growth? And, you know, everybody has different opinions on that. I usually think they're roughly the same, but as a broker, I'm always a little optimistic and put my expense growth at maybe 3% and my rent growth at three and a quarter, three and a half. But then I have my tax growth because of the way things have happened in the last couple of years, really last five years in Cook County. I think my, my real estate tax growth rate is 5% minimum. So. For, the, for the triannual uh, year, when you're doing deals, are you looking at the taxes different or are your deals, your OM, are they different based on it being that year versus maybe next year will be, you got right. another two year window? So next year, I'll, I think it'll be a lot easier to just slap in a 5% tax growth uh, growth rate on it and just say, hey, look, your taxes were $20,000 this year. And next year, they're going to be 21000 uh, Last year, <laughs> it was really anyone's game. You can look at a bunch of different OMs from brokers within the same brokerage or brokers from across brokerages, and you're going to see a lot of different answers. What I tried to do was look at the assessment for 2021 because those came out already. And then I applied the tax rate uh, in the same equalizer from last year to try to calculate like, all right, if your assessments went up 75%, then I'm going to put in a 75% growth on your taxes and your actual tax bill. And knowing that that was probably a little too conservative because, uh, and as it happened, the tax rate did go down. And so, you know, if you had a 75% bump in your assessment, you probably only had maybe a, a 30% bump in your taxes, which is still enormous, but that's exactly how I did it. And it's better than getting pushback for every buyer is going to be doing the same thing. So they're going to look at me. And if I put in a tax number, that's really low. People are going to ignore it. Before we go any further, it, we're, we're talking about uh, these in generalities here. Is there any difference here for anybody that's buying maybe a C or D class building versus A or B class for anything we've talked about so far? In my experience, the C or D class buildings will be taxed at a little bit lower rate. Um, usually they're uh, just maybe in need of repairs, haven't been traded more as recently. And so their, their tax bill is maybe at like 10%. I even have one that I'm closing on in a couple of weeks that's I think currently at 9% of its gross income. Um, and A and B class buildings are typically closer to that 16 to 18%. So there is a little bit there. That I've seen. Cool. What were some of the other hard costs, Rick? So hard costs, both basically the way I view it is hard costs are ones that a you know, broker doesn't have to play around with. Like, hey, this is your utility costs, your gas, your electric, your water, uh, scavenger, third party costs, um, third party is in contract services. If you have trash pickup, recycling, landscaping, uh, snow removal, uh, these costs we put in actuals and those are less likely to change uh, greatly depending on the operator, right? Just because Tom takes over a building, that doesn't necessarily mean that the, the, he's gonna somehow magically reduce the gas bill from the boiler, right? It's just not gonna happen. So those you can be pretty confident in. The, uh, the soft costs when you see, and, and at least when I do my underwriting, I have a little one next to some of these expenses and that just indicates broker pro forma. 
And this is really where we make our, our estimates, right? And it's tough because it depends on the building, but I'm looking at management. I'm looking at maintenance, repairs, decorating costs, which is basically the cost of turning over a unit after it goes, uh, when you have a change in the tenant. Um, and then reserves, depending on how much you want to keep in your operating reserves to, to handle any capital improvements that need to get done. But I mean, those vary wildly on different buildings. I mean, if I'm looking at a, again, I keep going back to a six flat because I think that's you know something that the audience here is, is going to be interested in. A six flat, if, if Tom, you're a pretty handy guy, um, are you going to be handling the management yourself? Are you going to be fixing some of the plumbing issues? Can you handle tuck pointing? I don't know. What, what can, can't you do and what do you want to do? Oh, just because I'm wearing a hoodie doesn't mean I'm handy. Let's, <laughs> broker making a wrong assumption there. Yeah, well, that happens. But, okay, I make <laughs> no, a thousand I assumptions a day. I can be wrong. <laughs> Not just the weather, man. No, but but to go to go down that route, like you know, how much of your time, how much experience do you have, how much time are you willing to give up? You know, I think a big one too. People don't talk about leasing. They end up not leasing the unit. They end up they have a turnover cost. They have a vacancy. They have to pay that guy or girl a half month. They had you know that eats you up, man. That 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 can that's a big number if you're if that's the route you're going to go be, to get your time back. Right, and so on a six flat, a lot of owner operators will do the leasing themselves, right? It's just, it, it cost effective. It makes sense. And it's not during, if you, if you align your leases to end in summer or like it's a, it's a narrowing window of when uh, the leasing season is right now, but if you can get your leases to turn, I would say May, June, July, you're going to be able to lease those units on your own fairly easily. I hope um, opposed to needing to hire an agent and pay them half a month. If you have a, you know, I have a 140 unit building on the market right now that's new construction and no one is going to be leasing that. No one's buying that building and saying, I'll handle the leasing for a hundred plus units. Right. So there you have to build in your, uh, you know, leasing and marketing, right. You're going to have different line items for the different types of buildings. Um, and it will be significantly more expensive to operate a building like that. You know, do you, do you run the OMs though, as you know, most uh, banks, uh, lenders will look at building a manager fee and they're building that leasing commission because you might not be able to do it all the time. You know, if Tom and his six flat Tom moves away, then he has to hire somebody. His property still has to be profitable at those, call it worst case expense ratios. He's just not paying himself is where he's saving the money. Do you typically so, run it that way? And so like, and that's the same thing. Like I, I have to, lenders are going to underwrite to be conservative. They want to make sure that their investment is, is safe and brokers are going to be a little bit more aggressive. Um, I still put in 5% vacancy. I put in 5% management, even though most of my clients, when I talk to them after a year or two years of managing a building, that, you know, you know, someone Tom works with always tells me that he keeps his, his buildings at 2% vacancy, right? But when he's buying a building, it's 5% vacancy because that's how a lender is going to operate. Uh, same thing with management. It depends. I'm going to put in 5% management. If it's a six flat, I might kick that up to 7% depending on the neighborhood. I also might remove the janitorial fee, right? It, how do I think? And, and this is, for me, it's always is just because one person will keep their expenses really light. The next guy might look at it and he might be buying and living, you know, let's say he lives on the West coast and he's buying this building because he likes Chicago, but he's paying management. He's paying a janitor. He's paying for all of these other fees that He's not doing any of the management or, or really asset management himself. So it's going to be a lot more expensive for that person to run the building. I try to find kind of a happy medium, a blended average of what everyone's going to do. And I'm going to constantly get yelled at by everybody looking at the building telling me I'm wrong. And that's okay. Because I, I just have to go kind of down the middle. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I dig it. You know, again, I'll, I'll just chime in my two cents here is you can make the best guess as possible. And the more you do, the, the better this gets because you have data. You can see how this other six unit performed for you over the last two years, right? But when you're buying that first one, everyone wants to be like, well, is, is maintenance 5% or 7%? And like the world doesn't work that way, <laughs> right? Like if, if, you go, if you go to a Cubs game and they average four runs a game, they might score four that day. They might score zero. They might score 12. They might score nine. It's, you know, when you have just one building, it's, it's, it, it's within a standard deviation. There's a lot that could happen there. Right. So you make that. your best guess estimate, but like, it's not a golden rule that 
things fit nicely into some little percent of your gross income. Like the world just does not work that way. And Tom, if I could add to that, I think that's a great example also for how you want to handle another one of your expenses, which is your reserves. Uh, reserves are there to, to pay for problems that arise or to do capital improvements that you're expecting. But you know, you buy a building and you, you see the boiler is 20 years old, that thing may shut down the next day. It may last another 10 years, but you can factor in like, I'm going to have to replace a boiler. I'm going to have to replace a roof. I'm going to have to do tuck pointing every couple of years, three years, five years, whatever you choose to do. And so how do you put that into your reserve budget, right? You may score four runs one day and 20 the next, unless you're the Cubs. Yeah. It's, <laughs> but it, when you have more units, like it becomes, those numbers do start to become true because you have enough, you know, you have enough sample size. Whereas that one building, everyone's looking at their one, three unit being like, is my maintenance this? And it's like, well, it's, 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 a, it's an impossible question. Yeah, right? it is. I, you because know, you, I understand you know, where you're coming from and I understand you want to get this right, but it's not, the world does not work that way. Well, I, I think it flows into your management style too. If you're going to, if you're going to be, Correct. if you're going to be an aggressive proper manager and, and run thin, or if you're going to be, uh, you know, you got to live in one of the units and you want to keep everyone happy, like your expenses and your maintenance, are going to charge back tenants. So like, so like that, the guy, one building, you could have a guy that's got 5% and a guy that's got 14% like maintenance, like literally because of the way they actually operate it or the way that that's their style. Maybe that, that now don't get me wrong. The guy that spends 14%, maybe his, he makes it up in his uh, lack of turnover. His average lease is 52 months versus 36 months. So that, that uh, those are all things that come into play too, of when you got to make the decision. So I would add to that, Mark, in that when you have a lot of capital improvements that you're going to make in the next 10 years, if you, let's say you're buying a six flat and you know that it needs a new roof or it know, you know that you need to put in new cabinets and new appliances and all that. A lot of clients of mine will say, you know what, I'm going to put all of those capital costs, I'm going to do that right away because I'm going to be spending that money now or I'm going to be spending that money in the next 10 years. And if I do it now, then I'm going to be reducing my turnover because people will actually like to stay there longer. And it's just a strategy. Right. And everybody has different strategies. So it's, it's really challenging to make these assumptions and know that you're right. Can we go back to utilities real fast? Um, yeah. You know, especially in these boiler buildings, you know, if you get a $50 common area electric bill or $50 gas bill, like that's not a big deal. That's not where you could be 100% off and really not screw up your pro forma. The, <laughs> but the uh, where you're paying your, uh, uh, you're paying for the entire building, you're paying either baseboard heating or you're paying with a boiler. Where, as a broker, are you getting that information? Are you getting the actual hard uh, statements from owners? And, and I guess the uh, second part of that question is, where can buyers get like real information in, uh, when it comes to trying to, to explore their own numbers and verify? So, yeah, if I see that there's a huge gas bill in a building, I know that it's a boiler building. I know that they're paying for heat, right? I know that it's not HVAC. Um, and then I have to go to the building, right? Anytime I'm underwriting a property, I, I won't underwrite a property unless I can tour it and, and see the actual mechanicals. But I don't know how, how someone can independently verify a gas bill um, other than you go through your due diligence and you look at the gas bills for the last couple of years and see how it's, it's operating. I mean, my pro forma typically when I'm saying, okay, the, the gas bill for this four plus one which is uh, you know $25,000 to heat 40 units. And next year I'm going to assume a 3% bump just because that's what I'm going to assume. I, I can't say that a new owner is going to change that. Does that make sense? Unless I know they're going to remove the boiler and put in individual HVAC, then that's a capital expense that I have to underwrite for. And then I have a post renovation and it's a completely different uh, column. I know. Uh, do you ever refer people? I, I, we could put the links into, I should try pulling up real fast, but people's guests and Nycor, so Nycor in the suburbs, they have some sort of uh, 12 month uh, past history that people can pull up uh, to be able to estimate. So maybe we can uh, pop that link in there as well, too. I didn't know that they were willing to share that for specific buildings. That's awesome. Yeah. The Realtor Association in the MLS listings, they used to have it where you could, as a seller, put your account number in there and do that. That went away. I don't know for what uh, reason or if it was political, but uh, um, yeah, it's, it's just we'll add that in there, that calculator. Yeah. That, that oh. seems you. All right, so let's talk. We we have our income and expenses. Just and we can okay. talk about these all day, but to, to move this forward, we have income, we have expenses. What do we do next? Like for someone who hasn't gone through the actual algebra and the calculations here, walk us through an example here. We have income of hundred k. You know, expenses are forty thousand. This is before any debt. Well, right. Walk us through here. 
So what you want to factor in, and this we can start talking about how we value and get to a number here. Um, you have basically your income, subtract your expenses, and you get your net operating income, your NOI. That's going to be something that you're going to hear a lot of. Uh, most of you are aware of that. And your NO, uh, before you even get to NOI, if you just look at your gross income, a lot of people will use uh, what's called a GRM to value a property. And I don't know why this is so common in Chicago. And, and when I started, everybody just used uh, the gross rent multiple. I'm going to figure out, okay, I'm grossing $100,000 on this six flat. Okay. I'm going to look at comps. And obviously I know the comps in North side, let's say 10 times gross is roughly uh, what a building is trading for 10 times hundred thousand dollars. You have a million dollar building. That's the value. That's what I'm going to pay for it. That's how some guys do it. And other people will want to take it a step further and say, well, I can be a little bit more specific in valuing a property and I want to use cap rate. So cap rate takes your net operating income, right? So you take that hundred thousand dollars minus your $40,000 of expenses. You've got $60,000 in net operating income. Divide that by your total purchase price, and that will give you your cap rate. And so uh, on this example, if it's $60,000 and I want to pay a million dollars for the building, that's a six cap, 6%. Um, that's great. And for a lot of properties for many years on the north side, a six cap and a 10 times gross made sense. And people would buy buildings at that price. Yep. But now, now why that? Tell us why that may no longer make sense. So, and this is something that I think we were talking about a couple of months ago. Um, for anybody who's been living under a rock, you, you may not know that the interest rates have uh, climbed quite a bit in the last six to nine months, where deals that we were doing uh, in the first half of 2022, you could get an interest rate of 4%. And this is where I wish I had my computer still alive, but at 4% interest, uh, a six cap looks very different than a six cap at 6% interest, which is where we're, we're at now at the end of November. And so yeah. basically what we're, what we're doing there is uh, a lender is going to look at the debt service and uh, they're going to say, Hey, if, if we're at this interest rate of 6%, it's going to cost you. Um, and I think I put the numbers in that outline, but maybe like $54,000 on a million dollar building. If you're putting, yeah, so here, let me, let, I'll just share because I, I do have it pulled up here. Yes. So you buy a million dollar building. The examples we have was, you know, a hundred, hundred grand of gross rent. Mm -hmm. We had 40 grand of expenses. So you had, you know, 60 grand left over before debt at a 4% rate at 25% down, you know, the, the debt service would be 43 grand for the year. Okay. And so that leaves you roughly call that what? 17 grand, right? Did I do that right? Uh, minus 40, 60, 60 minus 43. You have about 17 grand of cash flow for the year, which 17 grand over that 250 grand you put in, that was your down payment, mm -hmm. was a cash on cash of 6.8%. Mm -hmm. And then if you do principal pay down as well, it's a total return of about 12%, which in a nice north side neighborhood, I think most people feel pretty decent about that. Right. Depending on, you know, again, this doesn't look at any of the capital improvements you might have to make a building. We're assuming that Correct. building's in good shape. You don't have to put money into it right away. Um, yeah, I think that's been generally the market. And I think that a lot of, of my clients, when they're looking at properties, yes, cap rate's very important, but ultimately it's important because of how much money you're going to make on it. Right. And so at, at a 4% interest rate, what was it? It was 6.8%. Is that what yep. you said? Correct. 6.8% yeah. return on cash on cash. That's not too bad. And back in July, especially when, what was your alternative, right? If you put your money into a CD or just a, you know, interest bearing savings account, you're making nothing right now. I think that's bumped up and, and you can make over 4% in just a, a CD. Right. And so maybe 6.8% isn't as attractive right now. You might need a higher return. But let's look at the difference. And uh, what was the, so if I'm buying the same building at a million dollars, same cap rate, same GRM, right? It's a 10 GRM, million dollars, it's a six cap, but it's gonna cost me a lot more to get that same loan. Yeah, because- So, yeah, so just to pull, cause I have it pulled up, you had a hundred grand gross rent, you had 40 grand of expenses. So you're at 60 K. The debt service now climbs all the way up to 54 grand. So two things happen here. 
your cash flow goes from 17 grand to six. But not only that, you don't have debt service coverage ratio now. So you can't get a loan at 75% loan to value. So now you need to put more money down and you're getting less return. So your cash on cash metric, you now have a bigger denominator, right? You have to put more money down to get the same deal and you're getting less of a return on it. So you get squeezed both ways and it, it kills you. Right. So it's harder to, to get that equity available. And then you're not going to for the same, for, for even the same return, but now your, your return is just crushed and your, your cash on cash and your total return. So in that example, that same million dollar building, what was the cash on cash? It was like 2%, if I remember correctly. Yeah, we're, we're just over three, but it basically gets cut in half just from the rate jumping from 4% to 6%, all other variables can sit equal. Right, you got yeah. to put 34% down. That, that's a huge uh, outlay of cash in, in addition to that. Like th- that, That's the opportunity cost Correct. for that additional money. $90,000 that you are no longer have access to. So yeah, that's, that's a huge deal. And so you know, when people use, and that, that's why I, I always say like, yeah, I can use cap rate. Cap rate's really important. It's a great indicator of value. But if you're not factoring in the debt market, it, unless you're paying for everything in, in cash, which I don't think I've had anybody actually do in the six years I've been doing this, um, it doesn't matter. It's really your cash on cash return and your total return that you're going to get. Your cash on cash is like, especially for most of our listeners, is like the most important metric because that's telling you exactly what you're putting into it. The cap rate is really relevant to your personal growth of your wealth. Um, that you, you, opportunity costs definitely, but that cash on cash is what it's doing for you because you know the whole burst strategy is huge for that reason that you're only leaving zero to ten percent into a burr deal because your cash to cash high. Even if you only make a couple hundred dollars a month, you're getting all these other benefits of owning a piece of real estate and not having to uh, have any cash out of your pocket. So, uh, cash on. Uh, I just think it's huge. And I think it gets overlooked and the word cap rate gets thrown around because I think people think it's fancier. Right. And, and people love using cap rate. People love using GRM, which I think is even less useful than cap rate. GRM. Uh, so a lot of our listeners are familiar with like the 1% rule. It used to be 2% rule. Like it's similar concept, just in a different way of calculating it. Correct? Yeah. It's uh, the, the 1%, 2% rule. And forgive me, I haven't heard those in a long time. It's something about like the, the, 1% of the, of the uh, rent of the purchase price. So a, a 10% uh, GRM would be equal to a 1% rule, correct? It's crazy. Right. It doesn't account for expenses, you know, boiler building or not. It doesn't account for that $800 a month line yeah. item expense. doesn't account for how right. the taxes are. Compared so you, don't, to, like, you can't tell just, how good of a deal like, the guy that's got his individual furnaces versus the guy that has a boiler, like separation of, of which one's more attractive. Right. And so the, the GRM is great, but when you factor that in, you just have to know the type of build and you brought it up. Like if it's a boiler building, the GRM is uh, going to be very, it's going to be the same as an HVAC building, but your expenses are going to be much higher. So, you know, I would need a, a lower GRM to buy that boiler building. So we're going into a, a transition though, period. And, and it's always the sellers that have to, they really control how the market's going to go how fast it's going to shift, right? So this same building, say this guy puts that building on the market. I don't know if, how real of example this is, but if this guy went on the market in July with these expectations and everything changed and you have to go present to him, it takes this guy either taking it off the market or him to adjust down to really change that that listing for you as a broker or you know, that time to hundred buildings for the entire market to shift to back to being realistic. Yeah, so there's definitely a lag between seller's expectations and, and meeting buyer's expectations once something like this happens. But the other thing that you know we're just factoring in looking at interest rates, there are a lot of other factors that come into play. You know, since we'll talk about, you know, in January of 2022, yeah, interest rates, I was seeing deals get done at well low 3% in interest rate. And uh, since then, yes, interest rates have doubled, but rents, I mean in Chicago, we had one of the best rental markets or rental seasons that I've seen and that I've heard from other brokers and other uh, housing providers, it's been the best in 30 years. And so while interest rates have definitely hurt uh, and, and affected our cap rates, the, the, rents, the rent growth has really offset a lot of that. So that's why, and, and I don't know if you guys are seeing it, but I have not seen prices come down significantly. And it could just be that we're during in that lag period right now, but, you know, I've, I've seen, 
it's not a one to one ratio, I guess, is my point. Just because interest rates go up 200 basis points, it doesn't mean cap rate is going to go up 200 basis points. Well, the question is going to be around uh, how much the more rent growth will get. And, and I, my personal opinion is I don't think we'll get that much. You already see other hot, like, listen, Chicago had a great season um, and other cities like Miami, they went up 30, 40% in, in some of their, their rentals and they're starting to come down now. Uh, but I think similar to uh, we're in the Midwest, but I think you're going to, we've had slow rent growth in the previous years. And, and then now we got it, uh, it all at once. And I don't think it's going to continue up in any crazy trend in that sense. So I think that's going to be something that when that reality hits this spring, it's going to, uh, uh, I think that people are going to have to start being realistic in that sense. And so this is where the, the optimism of a broker comes in. And, and I'm going to take the other side and say that I, I do think it's going to be as strong as a rental season as we saw last year. And I just think that part of it is, you know, you mentioned Miami and some other, some of these other growth states that saw 40% bumps in value and, and rents. We didn't experience that. We experienced 15 to 25% rent growth in certain neighborhoods of the city. And I think a lot of that was just kind of returning back to pre-COVID levels because we were deflated a lot. But also I see a lack of, of quality housing in Chicago still. I think there's a glut in, in supply and there's still a high demand. Um, I don't have the, the facts or figures with me, but I know that um, our population continues to, to grow very slowly. Uh, in the last 70 years, we've only lost uh, people once in 72 years. And it was like 20,000 total population. So like, I see more people coming into the city and I see not a lot of construction uh, relative to other cities. And so I think there is a, a high demand for high quality housing. So I think it is going to be a strong rental season again. But we'll, we'll see. Let's, uh, let's break something down though here for a second. Cause I think you keep using the word season and, and that's your only, but we haven't had a season in the last uh, 10 years, even coming out of the recession, like it used to be when I first got my real estate license, I'm both on the sales side and the renting side, you didn't do anything to after Super Bowl, And if you didn't have your place sold or rented by Labor Day, you're done. <laughs> so, or you had to drop your price drastically. And that was a season that was a real thing that happened for decades before. And coming out of the great recession, um, you know, that was something that, that changed where you had so many different factors that came in, people moving in and out to the city and you had all these foreclosures and you had this huge boom in multifamily. So our seasons went away. And I think this year we had a huge, listen, we rent about 40 or 50 places on a monthly basis. And we had a huge, uh, just like you're saying, so I, I can definitely confirm with that, but we hit a wall in, in, uh, in October, end of October and, uh, mostly on the, no on the North side and, uh, worse than anywhere. But I wonder if that's going to just be all right after New Year, after end of January, that picks back up and we go back to this traditional seasons of, of renting. So good for you and making it until October. Uh, I, I'm telling you, like it was so hot in May, June, first half of July. And then it, it, it almost in like the second half of July, um, I was out of town for like 10 days. I come back and it was a completely different rental market. And again, I'm not an expert on the rental market. I'm, I'm sales side, but because it's so intertwined, I have to keep my, my finger on the pulse. And it seemed like it just evaporated. And by September 1st, if, if you had a vacant unit, it was vacant. And also I think a lot of that is people were so busy filling up their units in April, May, June, that they just didn't have any vacancy left. And so I, I, there weren't as many units on the market and the ones that were on the market, pe people had already found a place to live, I guess is my point. We, and we so, struggle more on the North side with the bigger units, like the three and, bedroom, four bedrooms. That, that's a lot of what we hit the wall on. I right. think the higher you go up the scale, the the more that that person, this is a big stereotype, but the, the more you're charging three grand for an apartment, that person's not looking to move in November. They've scheduled their life conveniently to move in May. Right. Like they're unless they're switching jobs into a new metro or something crazy, like they're well ahead of they think well in advance. They're it's just a more sophisticated person that is not going to move in December. They might have did it once when they're 22 and they said never again. And sure enough, never again. They didn't you get the it. four roommates in, in October, November. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And it's uh I don't know. So when I when I hear seasonality, I, I do think the season is back. And I, I have not been doing this as long as you have, Mark, but since really 2018, I've heard the same thing every year from clients just talking about how, 
you know, October 1st is no longer relevant. You have to get units rented before then. And then the next year was September 1st. And it, it just feels like it's shrinking and shrinking to really June, July are those the, like May, June, July. You need to get your units rented in those three months. We ran into the other thing a few years ago too with COVID where like you're saying, you know, Chicago landlords, they want to try to get everything to end in April, May, June. And uh, when everyone, when COVID hit, they pushed all their leases back three months or two or three or four months. And that, that I think last year and the year before shifted the leasing season un, unofficially a little further out than what would, if it was going to return to a normal rental season, I think that messed with it too again. Uh, I, I don't disagree with you. COVID has shaken a lot of things up. So hopefully we're, we're getting back to the swing of things though. And, I, and that's the one thing that I would say to, to listeners is when you are scheduling your leases, if you've got some, if you got a vacancy in November and, and you don't, don't sign a 12 month lease, like either do a shorter, you know, eight month lease or do a year and a half, something like that. So that it does turn on one of the hotter seasons, a better month. Rick, I love your optimism. It's, it's ironic. Usually I'm the, the more optimistic one in any circle of conversation I'm having, but uh, looking out, you know, in these, in your, your OMs and, you know, we haven't used the, really the word inflation yet uh, too much in this conversation, but looking out at that, how much pushback are you getting from potential buyers when it comes to conversation around uh, the expense side of things with, inf- with inflation or what it could be or, or utility going up and so forth? Uh, I mean, even disregarding current inflation, I feel like I've heard from buyers, anybody looking at property uh, every year, it's oh, expenses are going up, labor is going up. I mean, the cost of lumber is a, a thing that I have to know these days. Uh, I actually don't, though. Is it down right now? I don't know. It actually went down. I was talking to Mr. Porch, Frank, over there, and uh, he said it, it's, it's came down a little. Right. And so, you know, expenses are going to go up. They're going to rise. And uh I think rents are going to rise with it, if not a little bit higher. And so again, that, that comes back to when I'm trying to value a property, if it is a, a huge value add play, um, it gets difficult to figure out where things are going to be in five, seven, 10 years. I will say this, I've heard uh, in a new construction building that I'm selling now, I have heard a lot of developers come and look at it. And what they're saying is, you know what? I could not build this building for what I can buy for it now. You know, it's, it's above replacement. And so if, if this building is $5 million, you know, that I can purchase it at, but it's going to cost me 6 million to build, then why am I not just buying this building? So that is, that is one of the like strongest motivators I have uh, in Chicago real estate. You take any brick, uh, brick bungalow uh, in Jeff Park, Berwyn, anywhere you could not build that building for the 250 or 300,000 you're, you're going to, you're going to, uh, uh, buy it for so like the reproduction per cost of some of this this historical like uh this architecture is is is, is huge i mean that the quality of those buildings right of, it, of those buildings you've yes. got bricks that are, you've got three <laughs> three brick depth on some of these exterior walls and it's just they're not made that in the same way so i hear that too yeah that, absolutely awesome i'm wearing my jeff park sweatshirt and everything guys thanks for thanks for representing yeah <laughs> Yeah. Almost on a whole episode talking about without talking about a Jeff Park bungalow. <laughs> Almost. Almost did it. Mark, anything else to add here? Are we good to wrap? We're good to wrap, man. Let's do it. It's been awesome. Oh, thanks so. Thanks so much, guys, for having me. All right. Oh, no, you got questions here. You got you're not. Yeah, you can't, you can't get out that fast. <laughs> Come on, Rick. Come on. All right. So what is your competitive advantage? How have you been able to do this with such success while so many others wish they could? You lead a whole team. Tell us how, what's your secret sauce. <laughs> secret sauce for me. I mean, I've always just viewed brokerage as, as an opportunity to kind of educate people and share information. Um, I feel like brokers for me, I just talk to so many people all day long, every day. And if I'm giving honest feedback and, and really put their interests ahead of my own, I'm going to be fine. Uh, it's, it seems to have worked for me, but there's really no uh, no way to succeed in brokerage unless you're going to work your your butt off. And I mean, you guys have had a lot of brokers on here, and I've listened to a lot of them, and it's it's the same or a similar story every time. It's just like it's a difficult job to do. There's a lot of highs and a lot of lows, and there's just no substitute for hard work. And you just got to pick up the phone. You got to go meet people, and always try to provide a service. If you don't have value, then why is somebody going to use you to you know sell one of their most important assets? 
right? It's a big decision to sell. And so when somebody says they want to list a property with me, especially if it's one, you know, an owner who's had a building for 20 years and it's the first time that they've sold anything, like it's meaningful to me. And I, I, I hope that that's uh, appreciated by my clients that it, it, I do take a lot of, uh, I would want to say honor in, in getting that assignment and I take it seriously. So I don't know if there's any secret sauce, Mark. Rick, what's one piece of advice you would tell someone that is yet to buy their first property here in Chicago? So like, what would I tell myself? There you go. What, what's the one piece of advice? <laughs> uh, the thing that I keep telling myself is you're never, you got to pull the trigger. Uh, but I would say be patient enough, buy in the right location, figure out what it is, you know, what area you want to buy in and then buy in that area. You know, there, like there are it. a lot. Of, yeah. I'm, I'll keep it simpler location. Rick, what do you do for fun? I hang out with my four-year-old, my two-year-old, um, and I play golf as much as I can. Pretty boring. All right. So give us a good book, podcast, or self-development activity. Go ahead and pick one of those or several that you would recommend to our listeners. So uh, I'm going to do a, a, a shameless plug on a podcast that my wife has. And good. it's the the other podcasts that I listen to and, you know, I, maybe I shouldn't admit this, but I probably only listened to like four of those episodes, but she has uh, one that she does with uh, a former colleague of hers. Uh, they're both in, in special ed and uh, primary teaching. So um, it's called, and then we had kids and it's just all designed for new parents as they deal with their little kids as they develop. We'll, we'll link to that in the uh, in the show notes. Oh, man. She, I mean, she'll be thrilled. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Mark. So we know this is his secret sauce for being married. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there you go. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. All I right. should probably Be listen to more of those episodes, though. All right, we'll <laughs> edit that part out. Um, besides <laughs> yourself, name one person in your local network that you'd highly recommend to other investors as a quality resource. Ooh, come on. I've got so many now, now I'm going to get yelled at if I don't pick the right person. Um, hmm. Do I want to go lender? I'm going to, I'm going to go with uh, Matt Cohen at Chase Bank. All right. We'll link to him in the show notes. So Rick, thank you so much. You provide a ton of value to our listeners. How can they learn more about you? Is there any way they can provide value to you? Just keep doing what you're doing, listen to the podcast and uh, give me the opportunity to work for you and, and advise as needed. Uh, happy to, to help people figure out how they can uh, get their first or second or third building. Good stuff. All right, let's get our Chicago facts here. Mark, who are we playing for? All right, today we're, this Chicago fact is brought to you by Reno Renovo Financial and Ravi Moshi. Out of Rogers Park, bought a T-shirt. Uh, looks like a couple, few months ago now, uh, July. And uh, if you get, if I get the Chicago fact right, and and if or if Rick gets it right, then you'll get a fifty dollars gift card brought to you by Renovo. Right, it's multiple choice, so we got a 50-50 shot here, Robbie. No matter how dumb our uh, contestants are. Oh, so, so Rick, we just got to help Robbie. We each take one. <laughs> I like yeah, it. Here. Don't don't double up on the answer, guys. Math teacher over here. So we didn't get too much into this, but uh, our guest today was you know taught for seven years. I didn't realize this, but from his LinkedIn profile, was also the golf coach at Nutrier. And he mentioned he loved golf. So we'll, we'll tie in a uh, Nutrier question here. So uh, Nutrier opened in 1901. It was the first American high school equipped with, and your options are, A, a state-of-the-art projector room, B, indoor swimming pool, C, NHL-sized ice hockey rink, or D, a broadcast license for a radio station. The first American high school equipped with. I, I would have said uh, uh, B, swimming pool. Okay. I I think that's right, but I'm going to go D. The answer is B. Nice work, gentlemen. Indoor swimming pool. Nice. Heck yeah. That was total guess. So, Robbie, just uh, you got me on a lucky day. So, thank you for buying the t-shirt and, uh, and we'll get you your $50 gift card brought to you by Renovo. Nice work. Way to end on a high. Oh yeah. You, you know, it's great. Um, it was funny. You said Renovo earlier, you, you plugged them for something and, uh, it's just an easy word to say. 
and I'm not additionally plugging them and not paying me to say this accent, <laughs> but Renovo, like it's just easy to say. It falls rolls right off the tongue. But yeah, uh, it'd be an Italian restaurant. Yeah, yeah. It does we're, sound. Like we're going to eat at Renovos tonight. <laughs> um, all right, Rick. Awesome. Thanks for coming on here, Tom. Thank you as always, listeners. Uh, get uh, get the chance to be part of our Chicago fact on the end of each episode. We do it at the end of each episode and at the end of each of our Tuesday tips. So, Robbie today won fifty bucks, and we're going to enter him into the bigger drawing that we're going to do for the end of the year with the with the uh, prize that has not uh, been talked about yet, but it'll be something cool. So. Uh, listeners go on to straight up Chicago investor.com merch store and uh, purchase yourself. Uh, right now it's cold. So purchase yourself a nice hoodie. So uh, thank you, you again, go. Rick. Thank you again, Tom and listeners. We will see you next week. Awesome. Thanks all.